Fun fact, when I was writing this video, I got super sick and I had like really high fever to the point where I started actually hallucinating Alistair for like two nights in a row. Like I would close my eyes, just shaking, dying in my bed and suddenly I would just like hear, <laughs> let's begin. Like that was so fucking insane. I never experienced anything like that. I don't think Husband Hotel needs any introduction. Husband Hotel is one of the most interesting, weird and controversial projects that originated on the YouTube. Whether you're a big fan or an active hater, you have to admit that at the very least it's different. So it's no wonder that the pilot caught on like a wildfire and eventually reached the overwhelming popularity and support it has now, at almost 100 million views on YouTube. <laughs> the project was later on picked up by Studio A24 and on January 18th, 2024, started streaming on Amazon Prime, with new episodes releasing every week. I still can't actually believe that it has been Hotel went from a YouTube pilot to an actual Amazon Prime show. I guess dreams really do come true, it's kind of motivating. Hey guys, welcome to my new video. Uh, I know this is literally nothing like the usual media that I talk about, but... <laughs> I watch all sorts of shows and films and this immediately caught my eye because I watched the pilot back in 2019 and since then I haven't heard anything about the show. So if this is not your cup of tea then uh, feel free to click off, uh, I hope to see you some other time. Uh, but yeah, today we talk about the demon show. <laughs> I know literally no one will watch this but who cares. It, it is for me, for me and Vic. I'm not an OG has been Hotel fan. I watched the pilot back in 2019, checked news about the release of the show every year or so, but that was pretty much it. I do follow Helwa Boss more frequently, but that's only because a new episode drops every few months. I'm not really a big fan of that, but that's an entire can of worms we're not going to open here. After the pilot came out, the five year long wait for the show started. Because of no new content, has been fandom pretty much survived this hiatus only because of the fandom content, a uh, snake devouring itself kind of situation. But I've never been in it, and because I didn't really care about the pilot, Hasbin Hotel didn't make a big impression in my mind and I didn't give it too much attention. Until now. <laughs> Hasbin's pilot was always criticized by people. Some of their criticism was valid, but some of it was just dumb nitpicks that people made up, or on stuff that was caused by the project not being animated by a large animation company. But now that it's a full, officially released show, it can be stripped from all the defenses like it's a YouTube project, of course it's not going to be perfect, or it can be bad because it's only a pilot and finally judge for what it is. And I feel like it can be interesting to review it as someone who knows little to nothing about the world of has been before the show and doesn't have a relationship created with these characters before even watching it. I have a clean plate, I know nothing. The point of this video is to criticize it as objectively as I can and find out if it compares to other adult animated shows out there or if it's just bad like everyone kept calling it since 2019. I know this project's names has been Dragged through hell, pun not intended, and I really don't want to add more onto the hate. Whatever I say in this video is purely my opinion. If you love the show, great, happy for you. If you hate it, awesome, at least you saw something new. Please be nice in the comments, I know this can be a very controversial topic and I really don't want to start any fights. Be respectful of everyone's opinion, even if you don't agree with them, because everyone has them and it's fine. Also, I'm not going to talk about Bibsy Pop, the show's creator. I know there is some drama, but I don't know much about it and I want to judge this series uh, based on its content alone, so I'm not going to get into that. There are going to be spoilers and will be for the best if you watch the show before watching this video, but you don't have to if you don't feel like it. I'll explain the basic premise at the start and then you can just try to make sense of what I'm saying. But yeah, it would be for the best if you watch the show, I won't explain that much. Anyways, now that the intro is over, let's start this mess. As teased in the pilot, the show follows Charlie, a princess of hell desperately trying to redeem sinners and send them to heaven in an effort to save as many people as possible from the extermination, an event that happens once a year where angels come down to hell and clean out a part of hell's population. Her way of doing that was creating a hotel in an effort to rehabilitate sinners 
characters and teach them the right ways. We get introduced to our cast that will follow us for the entirety of the season right away. There's Vaggie, Charlie's girlfriend and number one supporter, who also serves as sort of Charlie's bodyguard, Alistair, a powerful demon that showed up at the hotel store mysteriously after missing for seven years, Angel Dust, has been hotel's first guest and hell's most popular porn star, Husk, a washed up alcoholic bartender who fell from grace due to his gambling problem, Nifty, a small and cute mate that also is weirdly psychotic and serpentious, an antagonist turned into the hotel's second guest. Together they work on the hotel and do various activities in hopes of proving both hell and heaven that redemption is possible. It's also a musical, but more on that later. Now that we're all on the same boat, we can actually start talking about the show. The show starts with its own twist on the Adam and Eve story and I really like that. I think it's really nice that they went original with it, that they didn't just take the biblical canon and ran with it. This is a theme with Has Been Hotel. I think lots of times it goes out of its way to be different than original. The world building is really solid. Every episode we learn more about the characters and world around them and the show does a great job of making hell look fun. It's a pretty unique interpretation of hell and that's awesome. I also love the fact that the show immediately starts with a threat, because I was kind of scared that they were just going to fuck around for a year and that the entire season is going to be filled with shenanigans and only at the end of the season they're going to get serious for the extermination and then next season is going to be the same thing and so on. Like yes, there is a threat of extermination, but they're all going to survive anyways and they have a year to avert it, but no, it's set up right from the start that the extermination time is cut short to only six months. And not only that, but there may not be another extermination. Like that's a great way to raise stakes right at the start. What I'm a bit unsure of is that the extermination is literally cancelled at the end of the first season. And that's a bit... Mm, like that was the entire premise of your show. What do you mean you cancelled it? But I'm just going to trust the writers with this one. The plot in the overall season is good. They have a lot to work with. The world is really fun and has lots of stories waiting to be told. That's why I sometimes didn't understand why they did meaningless shenanigans. Like a great example of this is episode 3, where the gang does various trust exercises. Like overall it didn't really do much and it was pretty much useless if we don't count Veggie's and Charlie's argument at the end that eventually leads into Veggie's dramatic duet with Camilla Carmine. Like, I think they could have made a way interesting B-plot to Alistair's A-plot with the overall meeting and give a better reason for starting the entire confrontation at the end there. Because it just felt really forced to me. It's really painful to watch this aimless fucking round where there are also pacing issues. Because it would be just so much easier to cut it out and give more space for the important things. For example, Mimsy, one of Alastair's very few friends, was introduced in the middle of episode 5, had few scenes where she dropped some lore on Alastair and bailed. Her introduction to the series was just overall so rushed and had such little impact on the story where it could have been just cut entirely. I don't know why they had the need to introduce both Lucifer, Charlie's dad and Mimsy in one episode, but yeah. Whatever crimes the show committed with the pacing, it made up in the story. It was genuinely intriguing, and it kept introducing new stuff gradually, so it never felt stale. I really liked the fact that at the end of the season, I was left genuinely satisfied, while at the same time wondering about the next one. Like yeah, it ended on a cliffhanger, but not a major one where I am like pulling my hair out crying. Like. I'm happy, I'm ready to see more. We don't get that a lot with series. I think it's a big trend lately to make a big ass dramatic cliffhanger at the end of the season so that people can like shit about it on the internet and be like super interested when it's not really needed. So yeah, props to Has Been Hotel for not doing that. I want to start off by saying I really like the voice and designs changes. I heard that the voice actors were changed because Viv Z Pop always wanted Broadway actors for characters, which is valid. There are lots of musical numbers, that's fair. I kind of really like Charlie's pilot voice though, so that kind of sucks, but this one's great too. The voice acting is great, they have really talented cast on their hands, I don't have much to say about it. What Has Been Hotel gets criticized a lot for is its character designs, and I get it. First of all, it is weird that everyone is super thin and skinny. Like I know it's with this style, but it really starts sticking out once you know this all the villains and characters that are disliked, sorry Mimsy, are not slim. It also doesn't really make sense to have mostly red characters in a completely red world, which I feel they made fun of in the show actually. 
and some of the designs feel really clustered, like for example husk. This guy is a mess. The animal motives sometimes make sense, but most of the time don't. Because while most characters have one, some don't. And it's really just weird seeing them next to each other. Like their designs are all over the place. But at the same time, I think they're all very fun to look at. Like at least they're not boring. I think great examples are Angel Dust and Alistair. Angel Dust makes a lot of sense. He's a spider because of his family's web of crimes. I googled this because I wondered if there is actually actually a meaning behind that. His design is mostly white, so he stands out a lot, and his looks and overall style make sense for his character. While Alistair, on the other hand, is very confusing, design-wise. We don't really know the reason why he's a deer. There are some theories, but nothing confirmed. He's very red and easily blends into the background. The white line on his suit doesn't really make much sense, considering he's all red and black. His hair, let's be honest, it's weird as fuck. Like, it doesn't match his time period nor anything, and like from the behind he just has it like shaved. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Imagine him ninja got a low table face. And he's also not really scary looking. Kind of underwhelmingly not scary looking, considering how often they try to make him look so. Another instance where the chaotic character design stacks out is the overall meeting and heaven. The overall meeting is generally okay, they all look kind of creepy, powerful and all that, and then there is this demon. <laughs> What happened here? Yes, some worlds can have neon and bright designs, like for example Zestiel, but the majority of his body is black, so it kind of evens itself out, like he looks good. <laughs> well, this is just insane, absolutely does not fit. At first I thought they were a hellhound, because we've seen them before in Helba Boss universe, and you know, we know they exist in this world, that would not be unusual at all, but on a rewatch I noticed that it's a fucking dinosaur. Like, that's actually fucking insane. I did not know they can just be like dinosaurs. Like, what does that symbolize? What did you do before dying to deserve being a fucking dinosaur? I thought that to be an animal, it had to symbolize something. Like, the animal motive has to have a meaning, but I guess not. But if not, then why does Angel Das being a spider have a meaning? And if yes, why is Husk and Cat Owl hybrid? Then we spend the sixth episode in heaven, and overall, it's looking pretty good. I mean, there are some weird designs here and there, but it's fine. And then this one comes up. Everyone in heaven is very pastel and white, and suddenly this girl comes in, and she's bright red. What happened here? She just looks so off and doesn't fit here at all. Like, look at this screenshot. What happened? Uh, later on, I found out she's apparently Angel Dust's sister. That's the first thing I saw when I opened Twitter. So yeah, I don't know if it's true, but it would make sense. She's also a spider, and I guess by coloring her bright red, they wanted to point that out and maybe like make her stand out so that we can notice it. But it just doesn't make sense for heaven. She's the same color as Charlie, and baggy, but they pur but they're but they're purposefully but they're purposefully colored like the fuck I can't exp fuck but they're proper <laughs> but they're purposefully color but they're purposefully colored like that so they can stand out so that we can see they don't belong there fucking finally <laughs> unless it's a purposeful detail that will be later elaborated on I think it's weird to make her stick out so much another thing that I wanted to talk about was the foreshadowing with the designs I knew Veggie was going to be an angel since episode one because her outlines were literally the same as Adams and Lutz but then when I was rewatching it I realized no, actually lots of guys have colorful outlines, so I guess that wasn't a foreshadowing. Which is dumb, because of this, I wasn't surprised at all when she was real to not be from hell. Another person to have a colorful outline is Angel Dust, and I don't know, but I don't think he's an angel, so I really can't tell the reason for his outline being that way. Like I genuinely don't understand why they would purposely color angels' outlines differently and then randomly pick and choose who gets a different outline in hell. It's weird. 
I thought they were really smart with the designs, but now I see that they're just really messy and not that smart. Unless it'll be revealed that all of the demons with colored outlines were previously angels, these are just really weird design choices. Hi, post recording me here. While I was editing, I realized that literally everyone has a suit and or a hat. Like, yeah, I've noticed this before, but I've never realized that it's to this extent. I think with Zipov has a type and for some reason decided character variety isn't really a thing. Okay, Alistair and Vox having a suit, sure, makes sense. Of course Alistair wears one and Vox would for sure wear it just for the sake of imitating Alistair. Also wears a hat that is 2D because he's a flat TV and if it was 3D it would fall right off. But Angel does? Why does he have a suit? He's a porn star, not a businessman, he doesn't fucking need one. Lucifer also just wouldn't wear a full on suit. He's been depressed in his house for years at this point. Don't tell me he wouldn't be wearing the same pajama set for weeks. Husk is half naked, with a bow tie and a hat. Hell, even Charlie has one. Another thing that bothers me about this is Alistair's suit. Why is it like this? He should be classy, well-kept guy. Why is his suit on the top of a cross turtleneck sweater? I, I think, I genuinely don't know what that is. I'm pretty sure he would follow all the dressing rules because that's his entire thing. He's classy. He also wouldn't wear fingerless gloves. If he were to wear gloves, they would be some sort of leather gloves from the skin of baby penguins or something. And definitely not this. But yeah, the character design is so random. That's that's it from me, bye bye. I'm glad they simplified and solidified some of the characters since the pilot. Even though it's not that noticeable, I like them. I know I just shit on the designs for a while, but I genuinely don't hate the designs overall. I think they're very memorable and fun to look at at the very least. I just wish some of the technical details were more thought about. The characters are fun, like I can see why people fell in love with them in 2019 and kept waiting so faithfully to see them in the final product. Charlie is also a great protagonist. I personally really like her character. She's a great contrast to literally everyone else in hell with her naivety and genuine care for everyone around her. And that's what makes it really fun to watch when she snaps. It's interesting seeing different sides of her. What I kind of didn't like is when they infantilize her sometimes. Like, I don't know, her naiveness felt like a little bit too much every once in a while. I don't have that big of a relationship with Vaggie though. Like, she's nice, but I don't think she's as strong of a character as some of the others. Which is really weird because we learned way more about her than some of the others, so I really don't know what went wrong there. Angel does go through his little own character development with the help of Hus, and I genuinely love that. I I really like the message of their song and their overall relationship. Finding optimism in your shit life because it's better than just sulking. Love that. What kind of sucked is that from this moment on they don't really have that many interactions. Like yeah, they got an entire episode centered about them, but I still would like to see more of their relationship. I hope season 2 will focus on them more. Nifty is okay. I really like the gag of her staring into the camera whenever it's on, it's really funny. I personally liked her better in the pilot though. She was more sweet there and had more personality other than likes bad boys. I'm not a big fan of this, it made me a bit uncomfortable sometimes, but that may just be personal preference, I don't know. I really like her relationship with Alistair. It adds onto the mystery of Alistair's weird ass social bonds and I find it really funny that they're friends. Like what a weird ass duo. Can't believe she was an overlord once. Sir Pentius is also alright. I think they went for the papyrus vibes with him but I don't think it quite landed. He wasn't annoying nor anything and was overall fun, just not very memorable to me. He had his moments though, I started liking him around the end of the show. like when he died, so <laughs> whoops. I don't know if he'll join the regular cast again, but I sure hope so. One thing that I found really weird about him though, or more like weird around him, it's not really his fault, is in episode 6 they go to the club and it's called Consent, and Husk is even like, oh, so cool that it's called like that, and then minutes after that they make a joke. I don't know if I'm reading too much into it, but it didn't feel consensual to me. It's weird. Adam is a show original character and I'm not really sure how I feel about him. In one way, I find it really funny that while being the first man ever, he is also the first misogynist ever. <laughs> like, I, I found that hilarious. But then he's also like obnoxiously evil. I know they want to push the entire idea of, oh, it's angels, but they're actually also not good. But he's just so cartoonishly bad, it's crazy. He's so 
obnoxious even in heaven and it really makes me question why didn't they start the entire discussion in episode 6 sooner like did nobody before this interaction think hmm Adam is actually fucking horrible why is he even here like I don't know I think he could have at least pretended to be a nice guy when around other angels so that he doesn't stick out that much like if I was an angel I would kick him the fuck out or at least start questioning my entire cause because like what the fuck was that like I don't think heaven would be so sure of being perfect if they had that fucking guy around. Flute is fine, I liked her, she was alright. Had some great moments with Adam, they were hilarious. They appear to have some kind of shield, sir! Oh, really? I didn't see this giant fucking shield in front of me, you dumb bitch! No shit! I don't have that much to say about her, to be honest. Lucifer became an instant fan favorite after showing up in episode 5, and I really liked him. The only controversial opinion I have on him is that I didn't care about the decks. Ah, hide your pitchforks. I found a bit forced. But other than that, I think he's really silly. It's absolutely hilarious that he pulled both of Adam's brides. Like, <laughs> this short king is truly ruling. I love that. I don't understand why he joined the finale fight so late. <coughs> Blood reasons. <coughs> like, that was kind of lame that all of these bitches fought Adam and weren't able to beat him. And then the ruler of hell comes up and destroys him without any problems. Like, come on. Felt kind of anticlimactic to be honest. But I think the finale is that he's going to become a regular in the cast, so that's pretty exciting. I'm really looking forward to that. It can be really funny having both Alistair and Lucifer in one place for an entire season. <laughs> I can't wait to see some of those shenanigans. Wait, did I forget someone? Alistair is one of the most popular characters in Has Been Hotel, and also one of the first people to be ever considered Tumblr Sexy Man Bates. You know your show reached the stars when that happens. Anyways, I think Alistair Outguru has been a long time ago. He is fucking everywhere, and it's literally impossible to avoid him. Everyone probably heard of him, or at least saw his iconic look by now. That's why I especially looked forward to seeing how they would handle him in the final product. To see if all the hype around him was justified. And to be honest, I have very mixed opinions on him. Let's start with the positives. I think he's really fun. I like how he's painted as an evil calculated maniac, which don't get me wrong, he is. But at the same time, he's also really childish and petty. This is where my two favorite songs from the series are literally Alistair rap battles, in which both of them, he's so pissy about not being in control, he literally throws a theatrical tantrum. He despises TVs only because of his pride and ego. Due to hating Vox, he refuses to even touch a camera because of his cockiness. Like, I find that absolutely hilarious. His beef with every man ever, apparently, is great, and it's always fun to see him pissed off. I also really like his backstory. Some people might find it edgy, but I just find it mysterious, and I like it. Personally, I like the pilot's retelling of the story better, but at least now we know more details. And I also like some of the creepy moments he has throughout the show. Sometimes, it's fun. Not always. <laughs> it's really cringe most of the time, but it can be fun. And now the negatives. I feel like Has Been doesn't have Alistair figured out completely and struggle with writing him. Sometimes he's really scary and threatening, and sometimes he's painted as straight up dorky. And I personally love that, like that's why I fell in love with Alistair, I think he's kind of embarrassing, but I don't think that was the intention of the creators. Like they want him to seem calculated and ominous and powerful and all that, and then they pull some dumb shit like, Alistair wants to stalk someone, so he sends in a fucking egg. <laughs> like what? Are you telling me that this bitch ass who can literally take over computers, teleport all throughout hell, manipulate space and time, and all that has to use an egg to eavesdrop on someone. Like, I'm so sorry, but that is literally so stupid. Like, how can I take this man seriously? There are lots of scenes where he's supposed to be, like, badass and evil, but it's just... Nah. He just genuinely looks goofy. And I'm not the only one that feels like this, because I saw people dragging the ending of State Gone Through Mud. Like, this is edgy as hell. On the other hand, he has his moments. Like, for example, the husk scene. I really like this. I think that this was the right amount of creepy. It reminded people that even though Alastair is genuinely decent to everyone around the hotel, it doesn't mean that he's a good person. And it was just a really good showcase of Alastair's powers and how, yeah, 
he is actually terrifying when he wants to be. So yeah, they can write a Laster well if they want to, but they just don't bother most of the time. Another problem I have with Alistair is him swearing. Like, he has three F-bombs in a show, and I'm personally only fan of the last one. I thought his entire deal was feeling superior to others due to being polite and classy, and I just really don't think swearing fits him at all. Yes, he has way less swearing in comparison to others, but still, every time he swears, it just feels forced. The three instances of him dropping the F-bomb is when arguing with Lucifer, when he's on the roof with Adam, and then when Adam breaks his staff. And personally, I think the only time the F-bomb would fit is the last one. Like, he was so caught off guard, so surprised, that he literally forgets his own principles for a second. He even drops the radio effect on his voice. It's that serious. But due to him swearing before, this moment isn't as impactful as it could have been. This is another instance where I think they're kind of confused with Alistair. It's a trend with his character to introduce lots of interesting details about him and then kind of retcon them later on. I wish he was more consistent with his principles and goals. You don't make a character mysterious by fucking up details you previously set up for the lols. Okay, now let's talk about the songs in the show, because it's a musical, so unsurprisingly there are a lot of them. This section is very, very subjective, because I'm no musical expert and I really don't know what I'm talking about, so I'm judging these songs only based on how much I like them. Happy Day in Hell starts off the plot of the first episode, and it's fine, I guess. It's not a song that I would bop to inherently, but it's also not bad. It's Charlie's I Want song, just as Inside Every Demon is a Rainbow, uh, the song from the pilot was. And I personally like that one a little bit better, but I still think the pilot captured Charlie's and her wants a bit better. Also, for some reason, the series has a really hard time transitioning from talking to singing, and sometimes it's just so funny. Like, the beginning of this one is a great example. What could they want this soon after i can do this somehow i know it like why did you just start singing girl let your girlfriend speak hell is forever is pretty okay too i love alex brightman so i was really looking forward to his singing and yeah did not disappoint but i don't think it was too memorable like the ending though it was really cool we get two songs in every episode and in the second one we get stayed gone and it starts with a sorry it starts with a sorry is very forgettable yeah i forgot about the song until writing this script so yeah, not much to say about that. But on the other hand, State God is so good, I think it balances each other out. I watched this entire part at least like 20 times by now. I love it so much. It's such a bob. It also gives us so much information. Shows that Vox is absolutely terrified of Alistair and that Alistair is petty as fuck. It's just great. I love the animation here, it's so fun. It feels like I'm watching a stimulation subway surfer type of TikTok. There's so much happening and god, I just love this. I wish Has Been had more songs like this. Sometimes when watching the show, I thought to myself like, does it really need to be a musical? Like, some of these songs could have been cut out entirely. But then a banger like this comes on and I'm reminded that, yeah, it's good that it's a musical. Third episode has Respectless and whatever it takes. Respectless is not really my cup of tea and the lyrics make me cringe a little bit, but I don't think it's a bad song. I just think it was kind of mid. Whatever it takes has a really strong vocal performance. The voice actor of Camilla Carmine ate it up, but sadly also forgettable. I also forgot about this song until writing the video. It gives us some info, foreshadowing of Baggy's secret, and it's overall good, but it just doesn't stick out too much. Fourth episode is probably the strongest, both plot-wise and song-wise. Poison is very, very controversial, but I can't really comment on them much because I'm not qualified to do that. For some it's very triggering, but for others it's a perfect representation of their hypersexuality and I don't know, I, I can't really speak on it. But music-wise, it's really catchy, definitely better than Addict, and I overall love this musical number. And then we have Loser Baby, which I personally think is the best song out of the show. Husky is really sweet and supportive, and I absolutely love the vibe of this song, it's fucking great. It's also just gorgeous visually. If you were to compare it to the other songs in this show, I think this one stands out the most, it's really good. 
Episode 5 won over my heart with Hell's Greatest Dad. Absolutely hilarious song. Love the fact that Alistair has only two songs and he fights a month in both of them. It's also really catchy. The you can almost call me dead part plays in my head on repeat. It's also really funky. I love the electro swing there. I think it mixes Alistair's and Lucifer's vibes really, really well. Visuals are great as always with the upbeat songs in the series. Overall, great introduction to Lucifer's and Alistair's relationship that will hopefully be elaborated on in season 2. More than anything is really mid. I didn't really feel much here because they had a really shit relationship before this, they didn't talk for years and now they think about how they're so happy they have each other. Like I don't buy it. Their relationship overall felt really rushed. They made fun of Charlie for having daddy issues literally the episode before this and immediately after Lucifer shows up their relationship is fixed. Uh, I don't know, it's it's weird, I, I don't like it. It also kind of sounded like whatever it takes and yeah, the song didn't stand out to me at all. Episode 6 has Welcome to Heaven and you didn't know. Welcome to Heaven is probably the worst song out of the entire series. Okay, introduction to heaven I guess. Forgot it existed once again. You didn't know has some good parts, some less good, but overall I think it's really important and hard hitting song. I keep singing the If hell is forever then heaven must be alive part on repeat it's it's stuck in my head again it's a really good line fun reprise i find it really funny how they just stand there when they scream that really good song next song on the list is out for love and oh my god this is a banger like as i said before camilla carmine's voice actor is an insane singer and yeah this is another proof of her talent love the fight scene it was really fun and entertaining to watch i really like that camilla helped baggy because she understands when someone wants to fight for their loved ones this song made me appreciate whatever it takes a bit more because i find it really fun how they tease this duo sooner i can also see the parallels between them that they drew from the fucking start and it's great ready for this is all Awesome. It's really fun that the only way Charlie can express herself is through singing. Like, how fun is that? I overall like the plot of making the cannibals help in the battle. I think that's a really unique way to introduce Cannibal Town and make the numbers bigger in the final fight. Another thing that I really liked about this song is how Charlie becomes almost a salesman at some point while trying to convince everyone to join her with Alistair in the back trying to help her with the pitch. They put a real big focus on their relationship this season, so I really can't wait to see what they do with it in season 2. Alistair's and Rosie's part is really adorable and it also kind of serves as a reminder of Alistair's ulterior motives with Charlie and yeah the song was really exciting and just good. Then there is the reprise of More Than Anything and I personally like it more than the original. It's shorter, sweeter, elaborates on relationship that we've seen for 8 episodes straight so it makes sense for them to be singing this and I just think it's really sweet. We have one more song to talk about but I'll save it for the next section. Uh, don't worry I did and forget about it. But yeah, the songs hold up. Some of them are really catchy, like they're surprisingly very good. I genuinely didn't think I would like this many songs. I think the reason why I love most of these is because literally the guy from The Living Tombstone is co-writing the songs and I used to be a big TLT fan, like play me any FNAF song at the function and I'll pass the dance floor, like <laughs> I'm killing it there. The last thing I want to talk about is the finale. At the time I'm recording this, it came out exactly two weeks ago and I want to look at it deeper because I think I think it represents the entire show very well and also had lots of interesting things to talk about. Let's get into it. The first third of the episode is all about them actually getting ready for the fight and the rest is about the fight itself. And I'm going to start it right off with saying I feel like the final episode could have been paced better. I mean, it wasn't terrible, but some things were really rushed. Or even better, introduced and then went nowhere. Which doesn't sound too good, considering the episode is only 20 minutes long. So the first thing that took me out was when Sir Pen just died and Charlie got super angry and got into her stronger form, which apparently meant getting horns and strong and red eyes and whatever. And she calls for Razzle and Dazzle, who transform into dragons and then and she's all angry and sad and all that so they jump onto the dragons fly up in a dramatic scene with music and people hyping them up and then they immediately fall down with charlie even in her stronger form getting completely fucked over by adam this entire scene i just described 
took 30 seconds. 30 seconds! Why did you even introduce the dragon forms and Charlie's pissed off form? You're going to destroy it in such a short amount of time. I think they wanted to split loot and add them up, so they made them fight Charlie and Vaggie separately, but that could have been done way better and smoother without the dragons. And I want to make it clear that I like their dragon forms, but if you have so little time to wrap up everything in the last episode of your show, then you gotta make some sacrifices and cut some cool shit out. Another instance of this is Alastair's fight. They teased this man to be one of the strongest demons out there for a season straight, and then he gets his ass kicked in literally 1 minute and 30 seconds by the guy he calls Sloppy. Like that was so anticlimactic to make him get fucked up by one hit that he saw coming. It took Adam a while to strike him, like he saw it. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad this happened because I really wanted to see Alistair get fucked. But making him ditch the battle in literally the first few minutes it started and then not making him show up until the end was an obvious way to get him out of it. If he was kept there, the entire episode could have been avoided by him just eating those angels up like he did before. They made him way too strong of a character, so if he wasn't scratched from the battle, the stakes would be non-existent. So of course they had to ride him out. Another another instance of this is when Lute and Baggy finish their fight and Baggy is almighty and leaves Lute to live with the fact that she was beaten by her. And that was so there just for plot reasons. Why are you letting her live when you, Vaggie, know better than anyone that she won't give up on her mission until you are all dead? Like, I know that the entire point of the, their hotel is, oh, people can get redeemed and maybe she will get better, but we all know Loot won't do that. <laughs> or at least not right now. Like, it was so fucking obvious that she would do anything to get to Adam. Like, I genuinely don't understand why she would keep her alive. Also, it happened in a matter of minutes and also went nowhere. Like, if we took this scene out of the show, nothing would change. She would just be missing an arm. Once again, if you can scrap a scene and literally nothing would change in your very poorly paced finale, scratch the scene. I also wanted to talk about Charlie. I absolutely hate how Charlie barely does shit in this episode. Everything gets done for her for some reason. Like the only part where she actually does something is the transformation part. But that ends in literally half a minute and after that she just gets thrown around until her dad saves her. Like I wish they let her do more. She's the main character of the show. Let her have her moment. Making Lucifer the one that ends the battle is super anticlimactic and overall just really lazy. Like of course he's going to kill Adam, he's literally the ruler of hell. Let the weak character struggle to kill him for a satisfying conclusion. Lucifer had barely any screen time and in no way deserved to end the battle. Then show must go on starts playing and they rebuild the entirety of the hotel in a matter of 4 minutes. Sure. Like I wish they took more time with that and maybe started season 2 with it, but maybe season 2 is going to be just too packed with stuff and they wouldn't have the time for it, so I don't know, I I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt here, maybe it's a good decision. The song overall is great, but my favorite part definitely has to be Alastair's Layment. Just a side note, if you call it Alastair's Breakdown, then uh, you're literally dead to me. These 40 seconds are so Jack's Layment coded and inspired, you literally can't prove me otherwise. This part deserves to be called the Layment. Anyways, these 40 seconds of musical masterpiece got stuck in my head on repeat and I genuinely adore this part. As I said before, has been struggled a lot with with Alistair and his overall character. But with this scene, they showed me that at least they know where they're going. I really like how open for interpretation it leaves us, because the number one thing that I was thinking when watching the episode was, why is Alistair helping them? Why would he go out of his way to get into harm's way? And this song kind of hints on that. Alistair starts singing it, presumably right after the battle, and after a few lines he suddenly starts singing about his deal, which means it has to be connected to the fight somehow, which can mean two things. A, he fought for them because he got cocky and forgot his powers are limited by the deal, which got him hurt. Or B, due to the deal, he was forced to fight in the battle, whether he wanted or not. Personally, I'm of the A opinion, because if he was forced to fight, he probably wouldn't be able to ditch so early on. But one thing's for sure, 
The deal is making him weaker, and that pisses him off. Alistair is literally all about control. He loves feeling powerful, being in charge, and feeling like he's the one in control of every situation. That's why he smiles all the time, because it makes him feel like he's always on top when others don't know what he's thinking. And with this deal, he has that taken away, no matter what he does. Someone owns his soul, and that makes them above him, stronger than him. And this drives Alistair insane. In this short sequence, we can see him literally losing it, looking around like he's paranoid, desperate to find a way out of this deal. And it really reminds us that, yeah, he's not as strong as he likes to pretend he is. He is only human, whether he likes that or not. And he can threaten everyone who reminds him of that all he wants, but that won't change the fact that he is not in control. And that actually starts a really interesting topic of what is Alistair capable of doing when he's out of that deal. Once he's free of it, he can be on top again, like he said, the one pulling all the strings. But until then, he's just a rat in a cage. He can do shit and it drives him mad. How fucking poetic is that? This scene truly broke me, I love it so much. Then he returns to the hotel, flips off Husk and returns to his shenanigans like nothing happened and that's just really funny. <laughs> the finale overall was good. The fight scenes were great, all of the characters had their moments and it was genuinely really fun to watch Has Been Hotel's animation. Like it's one of the most satisfying animations I've seen in a while. It really feels like I'm watching TikTok slime videos sometimes and I really like that. But as I've said before, I wish some of the parts were more thought about. Obviously, a lot of care goes into the show. It's really visible with every frame that everyone who works on it cares about it. But I also wish they paid more attention to pacing and keeping the story more clean. Personally, I think Has Been Hotel is really good. It has many flaws, but it has so many great moments that it kind of cancels each other out. I think I praised it a lot in this video, but some people maybe didn't expect, but I'm just so glad it wasn't boring. I think that's the biggest flaw a show can do, so I do feel okay with forgiving it some of the shitty writing uh, when it made me this excited. This show has some of the most interesting mix of characters on their hands, whether they're the main ones or just supporting and there's just so many of them you are sure to find your favorite its writing is decent the cast is talented and the animation feels alive its songs are catchy and fun and i dare to say that some of them actually hold up to broadway level of quality if they fix the pacing and start dropping some of their unimportant plot points for the sake of a coherent story i think it can be really good but i'm sure if the show gets more seasons and time to develop it will turn into something really great that can write itself into history as a big project that originated on youtube of all places i have so much to say about husband hotel but this video would be even longer than it is all already and that would be absolute pain in the ass and I would probably die while editing. I genuinely didn't expect to like it as much as I did. I went into the series with knowing literally nothing about it and left it with genuine interest in learning more. I don't usually watch animated shows but this one made such a big impression on me that I will definitely look out for season 2. And that's it for this video. Woo! I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did then feel free to check out my channel. Uh, I have more videos about queer media on there all of them are live action and literally nothing like this one but yeah you can at least like check it out if you want to hear more from me i don't know and if you want to be notified about when i upload again whenever that may be uh then feel free to subscribe if you want to hear more from me and care about my thoughts and some mediocre art then uh check out my tumblr it will be in the description i would say that i'm more active on there but that would be a lie anyways thank you so much for watching it means the world to me Take care, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.